looking at those last hours of Jesus' life, the words that he spoke. As I've been reading these and thinking about it, I think they're probably very well thought out and words that he really came to heart before he spoke them. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. A God that was willing to forgive the very people that hung him on the cross. That's forgiveness. And he's willing to forgive us. And then he says to the, to the thief on the cross, he says, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. What an awesome thought. That the very last moments of our life, we can be in paradise if we seek God. And last week, Jesus still isn't thinking about himself. He's been talk, thinking about the, the sinners, those that were committing uh, him to the cross. And he was thinking about that lost man on the cross. And now he's thinking about his mother. And he says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Because he's asking somebody to care for his mom. All about someone else. And today we look at Mark 15, 33 to 34. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachahame, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt forsaken? We probably all heard of times like the young girl or even Jude we can put in this spot. This girl was suffering from a rare form of cancer that even had the doctors baffled as they said about Jude. Everyone wondering how this young girl, this little girl could be so sick. And the doctors weren't saying it out loud but they would really be surprised if she makes it to her 10th birthday. And mom's trying to hold it together, and mom's trying to be strong, but she wonders in her mind, why has God forsaken me? For another mother that gets up at 5.30 in the morning, she slips into the shower to get ready for the day. The kids are still asleep. But by 7 o'clock, they will all be up, dressed, and on their way to daycare and mom to work. She'll pick them up at daycare at the end of the day. She will fix them supper, get them baths, and get them into bed. She'll sit down for a few minutes to relax. But 5.30 comes really early. And mom has thoughts of, why has God forsaken me? Because dad left over two years ago. And she's all by herself. In another community. Gentleman gets up and he goes to work. He's done this every day. Every work day for 16 years. He's worked in this same place. He gets up this particular day and he goes in. And at 2.45 in the afternoon he gets called to the office. And the boss says, I'm going to have to let you go. He has nothing but a pink slip to take with him when he leaves. Has a mortgage to pay, kids planning on college. He's angry and he cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? What have I done? We could all maybe fill those Ask that question at times in our lives. But over 2,000 years ago on a Friday morning in Jerusalem, it seemed like most mornings, but yet it was different. You see, death was in the air. Death was floating. Word had spread that the Romans were going to crucify someone that day. It was like a holiday for some people. When that happened... And it spread quickly and a ga crowd gathered out 
on the place of the skull where they liked to have the crucifixions where everybody could see. They were cheering and they were laughing and they were making wagers about how long they would last on the cross. And some of them were even saying the one in the middle looks bad. He won't last long. And then it happens. Then it happens. It gets dark. Darkness falls over the whole land. One moment the sun is shining bright and the next morning, moment it is dark. It was like the sun had disappeared. But it wasn't a cloud. It was just darkness. It was black. It was kind of icky. As I was studying this this week and thought about it, I thought about two weeks ago tomorrow when I was driving home from Garden City and about Dodge. I started this darkness. And it was just hanging over. I knew what that was. The darkness that was there was they didn't know. It was just dark. It was dark. And no one moved. No one was speaking. It was like there was an evil force over the land. It was very clear that the end was near for Jesus. And all of a sudden he says, Eli, Eli, Eli lama sabachite, translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the darkness, Jesus cries out. People have read this scripture for years, and they've studied it, and they've wondered. And I read the other day where Martin Luther was studying this text. He sat for hours. He wasn't writing. He wasn't saying anything. He was just looking at the text. And suddenly he stood up and said, God forsaken by God, how can it be? How could it be? I don't claim to have the answers. But I have a few ideas of things that might have been meant and things that people have said. Some people say it's a cry of delusionment. Some skeptics use this first to claim that Jesus ultimately failed in his mission. They seem to think that the words mean, God, you have failed. All is lost. But the people like that that think Jesus failed, they haven't read the rest of the story. Because when you read the rest of the story, you find out that he wasn't dead very long. That he did rise from the dead. Some say it's just a cry of physical suffering. We know the pain had to be enormous. Everything that he endured, everything that went on, but it was nothing compared to the pain of God forsaking him. And turning his back on him. There's some prophecy in this scripture because if you look in the Psalms, in Psalm 22, verse 1, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. And the psalmist goes on in verses 15 to 18 in that psalm he says my mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth you lay me in the dust of death dogs surround me a pack of villains encircles me they pierce my hands and my feet all my bones are on display people stare and gloat over me they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment does that not sound like the crucifixion might there be a little bit of prophecy in what Jesus is saying from the cross? 
This looks like the fulfillment of David's prophecy. We know David suffered, but he suffered nothing like Jesus. But Jesus, quoting that verse, says he knew the type of death he was going to suffer. But those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Are a cry of reality. In that darkest moment, when it was dark, the sun was not shining. God turned his back on his son. Martin Luther had a right. God forsaking God. God forsaking God. Because see, forsaken is a strong word meaning abandon. To desert. To turn away from. To utterly forsake. When Jesus cried those words, it wasn't because he felt forsaken. He said them because he was forsaken. God literally turned his back on Jesus as he was hanging on the cross. We probably all said at some time something such as that's a God forsaken place or you know my dad said it, I've said it, I've heard others say it but you know God has not forsaken those places. God has not turned his back on those individuals or on those places. But in Jesus' case, he turned his back. He turned his back on Jesus. But then we, people will ask, well, why would God turn his back on his own son? Jesus was hung on that cross. All of the sins of the world were placed upon him. Every sin that had ever been committed or every sin that was going to be committed was placed upon him. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now that's the NIV. I found a couple others that say it a little differently. A little plainer. Christ had no sin, but God made him because sin becomes sin, so that in Christ we might be right with God. And that was from the, the easy version. Easy to read. God's word says, God had Christ who was sinless take our sin so that we might receive God's approval through him. He took all of that sin, all of that sin, God is pure and he could not look at that sin on his son. He's pure. Jesus was pure until he took the sin and God could not look at it. But he did it that we might have the hope of forgiveness. I want you to imagine a cesspool. A stinky cesspool. It holds all of the sins it's deep, it's dark, it's full, foul, and all of those sins, all the lust, lies, murder, hatred, theft, adultery, pornography, drunkenness, bitterness, greed, and anything else that you could put in that category is in that cesspool. And when Jesus was on the cross that afternoon, when it got dark, it was all being poured out upon him. Every last bit of it. All of it. And for that reason, God turned his back upon Jesus. He turned away from Jesus. Because of the sin that was on him. Remember what 521 said, 2 Corinthians... God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That we might become right with God. Two parts to that verse. Jesus became sin so we could be saved. Pretty simple. 
But Jesus was forsaken by his father on the cross. Sin caused him to turn his back. So don't ever minimize the cost of sin. Don't ever minimize the cost of sin. Whether it's the little white lie or whether it's murder, don't minimize the cost of sin. And some people don't want to hear about the cross. They don't want to hear about the bad stuff. But boy, if it wasn't for the cross, we wouldn't have any hope. You see, some people only want the good things, the, the, the happy things. But without the cross, without the sins being poured out upon Jesus, there would be no forgiveness. There would be no hope. There would be no salvation. We would be lost forever. All of our sins would be upon us. Thanks be to God that we can be washed in the blood of Christ because God forsake his son. Jesus was abandoned that we might never ever be abandoned. Jesus was deserted that we might never be deserted and Jesus was forsaken that we might never be forsaken. Praise be to God. We have hope. Amen.